Welcome to the Broken Mirror Story Event. Wrong Turn by Wendy Cooper. Daryl gripped the steering wheel tightly. He'd made a wrong turn somewhere. Now, they were in a land that looked beautiful, but also weirdly artificial somehow. And the people, they all had the same eyes, lips, chins. His wife, Gloria, visibly shuddered, as she said mostly to herself, The only difference is variation of color. Mommy, I'm scared, cried their seven-year-old daughter. Katie, from the back seat. I know, baby. So am I. Gloria reached back and gave Katie a reassuring pat on her knee. It's going to be okay, Daryl tried to reassure his family. He would have sounded convincing, if not for the slight waver in his voice. I've just got to turn around and head back to where we were before we got lost, (laughs) he said with a laugh that was a little too forced. Quietly, he said to his wife, Just don't make any eye contact. I don't think that will be a problem, Gloria said, barely above a whisper. I don't think they actually see us. Katie whimpered again. Gloria asked nervously, Honey, where are we? Daryl's answer was him pointing a shaking finger towards a roadside sign. No. Gloria gasped. Yes said Daryl, as he gulped. Beverly Hills. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 1, page 76. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to another installment of the Broken Mirror Story Event. Nice. You just listened to Wrong Turn by Wendy Cooper. Wendy lives in Las Vegas, Nevada with her seven-year-old daughter and her husband of 22 years. She is a stay-at-home mom and also has a small daycare business in her home. There are currently no pets, but she is hopeful a fish will join the family ranks soon. She loves to read, quilt, scrapbook, and listen to podcasts. Nice. Thank you, Wendy. As... We explained last week, but I'm going to explain again. The Broken Mirror story event was based around the premise. Someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. All of the three stories that we'll be reading today are based around that subject. And uh, you just heard the first one. That's right. I really enjoy that story. It was just a lot of fun kind of like scriptopia last week that was what made it work for me was just the humor and the fun that was involved in it so we're going to do three stories again in today's episode like we did last week three uh broken mirror stories our second story of the day is called where once your soul dwelled and it's written by liz mirzievsky liz is a wife mother and teacher somewhere in Connecticut. She's been writing speculative fiction off and on since 2005. She's been published in Expanded Horizons, Toasted Cheese, Clone Pod, Motherverse, and The Drabblecast. In her spare time, Liz raises monarch butterflies in her living room and knows more about dinosaurs than a 46-year-old white woman should. And Liz also did the voice of the mom on that story that we just heard, uh, Wrong Turn. So thanks for that, Liz. Wait, 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 wait. Who did the music? Oh, uh, the music on Wrong Turn was Roger Subarana. A song coming up in Liz's story is also Roger Subarana, but there's also a song by Triad. And you can check out the links in the show notes.
Where Once Your Soul Dwelled by Liz Mirzievsky. My name is Mike. I need to say it and believe it. I need to know my home was once Connecticut, where only my mother lives now. I need to remember why I can never go back. Remembering this keeps me where I am and who I am. It is the only thing that reminds me that it was not a nightmare. I only wish it could have been a dark and stormy night. Maybe then I would have thought twice before stopping at that ridiculous gas station. The gas station so dingy and so backwards that if it weren't for the dim yellow light coming from inside and the urgency pressing upon my bowels, I would have passed it by as a relic. The day was dry and bright. I had been making my way across Connecticut, and so far I had been met by the summer green trees pressing over the Route 8 capillaries, twisting convoluted over the lower Berkshires. But it had been a dry summer so far, and the green leaves sounded harsh and ready to burn. The dust on the roads was constant, and I felt it coating my throat every time I breathed in, car top down, music blasting. And now I needed to use a bathroom, and soon... I hadn't seen a house for almost 20 minutes. This wasn't so odd since the northwest corner of the state always seemed empty, roads existing just to get to Massachusetts. What was odd was the abrupt parting of the trees and the barren look of the terrain, oddly flat and open to the sky, like it had been dropped down after being yanked out of Kansas. And there was that gas station, pumps sporting flaked red paint, resembling set pieces from Mayberry. I pulled in and the swirling eddies of dust collected and settled on the hood of my Mustang. The building was small, no bigger than a half dozen phone booths joined together at the hip, but it had what might be a restroom in the back. The windows of the station were covered in a white film, like soap had been swirled on the inside of the glass. The front door, an old wooden job with brass hinges, was slightly ajar. A dim yellow light was faintly illuminating the interior, bathing everything like a sepia photograph. I slammed my car door just to make some noise. Hello? I knocked on the door and pulled it open. Is there anyone here? If there was, it wouldn't be that hard to hide. The room was stacked with boxes, bins, assorted sacks, and cartons, all filled with what I could only describe as basement chic. Excuse me, is someone here? I asked again. I turned toward the register and looked at the wall behind the counter. A little scanning revealed what I hoped would be there. A small brass key looped on a lanyard of leather, hanging from a tack. I grabbed it and went outside. The bathroom was everything I imagined, with a palpable film of grease and age. There was no lock, so I put the key in my pocket. The door barely held itself closed on the crooked jam. I was careful not to make contact with any surfaces, which was quite a feat in my condition. And then there was the mirror. It was painted out black. Blackboard black, all flat, no shine. The brush strokes were wide, as if the painter had used a worn house brush and the paint was tar thick. Someone had scrawled the words, not for you, across the paint. The paint looked like it had been chipped here and there and dabbed over again. I started to pick at some of the thinner strokes. Can I help you? Ah! I screamed in surprise as the door flung open. The question didn't sound helpful at all. He held the door open, this skinny guy, maybe 20, could be 30 years old. It was hard to tell. His hair hung over his eyes, and I jerked my head in a subconscious attempt to make his hair move. He smiled, revealing a chip on the front tooth. His teeth were small and widely parted, the grin lasting unnaturally long. You all set? Or you need something else besides a key that don't work? Again, not so helpful sounding. His untucked work shirt had the name Mitch printed in magic marker across the pocket. I'm all set, thanks. Um, Mitch, is it? I pointed to his shirt. I stepped out into the sun and handed him the key, which he put into his markered pocket. On second thought, is there a store around here maybe to get something to eat? Mitch was staring at me, that smile still hanging out there. He didn't say anything for too long. All righty then. Thanks for the john, I said, heading for the car. About a half a mile up, he said. What's that? I had just started to turn over the engine when he spoke. Mingo's place. Just up there. He said. It's real nice. Okay, thanks, I said. 
I've seen creepy, but this guy must be in some dictionary somewhere, I thought to myself. Either way, even just a soda at this point would be helpful. Well, Mitch had been right about one thing. Just a short drive up in the dust was an old Winnebago sporting a hand-painted sign, Mingo's Place. A rusted awning provided shade for any customers who might be ordering food from the sliding windows. I can't say that Mitch was right about how nice it was, unless he meant for the flies, which seemed perfectly happy flitting about the picnic tables and garbage. I got out of the car, and now I could hear faint music coming from the Winnebago. The glass on the windows was dark. I looked closely, and yes, these windows were painted black like Mitch's bathroom mirror. Must have been a sale, I thought. Hello? Anyone there? I tapped lightly on the painted window and called in through the opened one. I heard someone shuffling to the window, and I stepped back a pace. It was Mitch, same long stringy hair covering his eyes, same tiny two wide teeth, front one chipped. But now he was wearing a white button down and an apron. Hey man, that's a little freaky. How'd you get past me? I asked, pointing down the road towards the gas station. Excuse me? He asked. He was squinting and pulling his hair back behind his ears. I looked at the name scribbled on his apron. Tony. Tony, huh? Tony closed his eyes slowly and opened them again, like I'd asked a tall guy how the weather was up there. You want anything? He had one hand on the sliding window. I guess I'd been staring for a bit, because he jolted me out of my freeze-frame thoughts. Listen, pal. Order something or go. I don't got all day, you know. So, what are you guys, twins or something? I was going to get him to answer one of my questions, one way or another. I put my hand on the sliding window just below his hand and smiled. He didn't seem to be in the answering mood, but I guess twins get sick of those kinds of questions like anyone else. I let go of the window and relaxed my shoulders. I was pretty sure Tony would close the window any moment if I didn't order something quick. So I ordered something quick. A cursory scan of the rusted menu inspired me. I'll have a burger and fries, Tony. Uh, Medium rare, if you don't mind. It looked like he did mind, and Tony ducked back behind the painted glass. I heard him scrounge around the freezer and pull out what I could only hope was good old-fashioned Connecticut beef and a pound of fries, but that was anyone's guess. I sat over on the picnic table, long abused by the local birds. I had to clear off some dried leaves and such, but now there was room for my much-anticipated lunch. I could still hear it frying away in the Winnebago, so I pulled out my phone. Still no service up here, which wasn't too much of a surprise in these hills. I was passing the time with a few phone games when the pickup truck pulled up, two passengers climbing out and heading for the blackened windows, both of them guys, both of them skinny, with straight hair flopping down over their eyes, both of them clearly Mitch, down to the too wide smile and broken front tooth. I felt my front tooth with my tongue, just to check, and it was still whole. They glanced over my way, and I caught a glimpse of names emblazoned across their front pockets. I couldn't make them out from my seat, but I decided to make it my business anyway. I made my way up to the order window and leaned in, arms folded up onto the counter, effectively cutting them off. So what's the deal around here anyway? I asked. The postman have all dominant genes? They didn't look amused. I got a look at the names on their pockets, scribbled in the ubiquitous sharpie. Tom and Cat. The one named Tom pushed past my shoulder, sticking his head into the trailer. Hey, Tony. He gave me a look, clearly checking me out for my strangeness and not being like everyone else. Tony came to the window and slid my burger and fries to me, all tucked into the red plastic basket. If my hand wasn't there, the basket would have gone over the edge of the counter and right into the billowing dust. Four fifty, said Tony, knuckles to the counter. I handed over my five and waited for change for a moment, but it never came. I sat down. Tony leaned over the counter. Tom and Cat pulled in closer, but it wasn't hard for me to hear what they were saying. I kept looking at Cat. This was one ugly chick, what with her looking exactly like every guy in this town. I was afraid to look to see if she had breasts. I was really hoping that she didn't. It wouldn't sweeten the deal, that's for sure. More than that, I hoped this was a guy who woke up drunk and just grabbed the wrong shirt. Either way, this was a lose-lose mind game for me, so I just listened instead. You call Mitch? asked Tom. His voice was tinny and thin. Tony looked over at me, all shifty. I've seen people do this before, and it always meant that the unspoken topic of conversation was close. 
Call me paranoid, but that look made me feel like the elephant in the room. Of course I did. You think I don't know the rules around here? His voice also had that tinny quality, like an empty metal can buzzed with a taut string. The other two looked over and Tom turned his back to me, whispering something to the other two. Cat looked over Tom's shoulder at me. You got enough there, pal, or should we talk a little louder? Cat's voice was as tinny as the last two, and a shiver went up my back. I reflexively waggled my head as I tried to release the idea outside of me. Uh, excuse me? I asked. I guess I had been staring, but considering the situation, I didn't think it a ridiculous thing to be caught doing. Nevertheless, I felt exposed, and my face was getting warm as I flushed in embarrassment. We loud enough for you? Cat spit on the ground. <laughs> me? I... I wasn't listening, seriously. I was just, um... I had nothing. Clearly, I had been listening. They turned back to their huddle, this time keeping their voices more to themselves. I lost my appetite, so I threw away the remaining half a burger and fries into the fly condo overflowing with ripe garbage. I looked around for a few napkins, but the only ones available were sitting right by Tony's elbow on the counter. I decided to wipe my hands on my jeans instead. I headed for the car, looking forward to driving beneath the leafy coverage of the back streets of Connecticut. Being out here, I felt exposed with no trees to make me feel close to the ground. The car looked so far away, the three clones going silent when I got up. Was there a target on my back? Did I look like prey to them? I certainly felt like I did at that moment. Each step to the car felt deliberate and dangerous, as if more clones would blindside me from around Tom's pickup, pull me to the ground, and suffocate me with a toothy death grip on my esophagus. I started walking faster. My fingers on the door handle, I took a quick glance over to the Winnebago, just to make sure no one had moved. But they had. Tony was missing from the window. Tom was on his way over to the pickup. Cat was making her way over to me. Where was Tony? Inside? Coming around back? Whether it was because of grease or sweat, my fingers slipped on the door handle, and it snapped back to position. I tried once more, quickly, with two hands this time, and the door opened. I was in the seat before I knew it, the key already connecting with the starter, when Cat put both her hands onto the door. Her man face was right up close to mine now, with a smile as big and as fake as any hungry predator. Hey, she said. No reason to be going anywhere just yet. She had crossed her arms over my rolled-down window, her face now just inches from my face. We didn't mean to be so rude back there, really. Tom started his truck and backed it up, turning it perpendicular to the back of my Mustang. Why don't you come on back and I'll buy you a soda? Tom was at the passenger side by the time Cat had invited me back to the Winnebago. He had a baseball bat. I'm pretty sure I screamed at the exact moment he took out my side mirror. You're crazy. I was still You're screaming as I climbed over the door by Cat, and Tom was wielding the bat against the rearview mirror. I caught a glimpse of Cat in the driver's side mirror, and I swear it showed a 20-something brunette, but it might have been my fear flashing back to a time when I wasn't scared shitless. He took out the mirror easily enough, giving my windshield a hell of a beating with it, but I was on the ground, crab-crawling my way away from them. Cat was saying something in her tinny man voice, but I was still screaming. What the hell? What's wrong with you people? Get away from me! I had reached the summer sawgrass, and I could feel the blades cutting through the skin on my hands as I skittered backwards. I pulled my hands off the ground in pain and landed flat on my back. All three of them were at me now, and I swung out wildly as they tried to help me to my feet. Get away, you freaks! Get off of me! And now I was hurling droplets of blood at them from my bleeding hands. Oh, get up, you idiot. We're not going to hurt you, said one of them, but I couldn't tell who. I was shielding my head and eyes, waiting for Tom's bat to take me out like one of those mirrors. I repeated my last question. What the hell is wrong with you people? I opened my eyes, and only Cat was close. Tom was thumping the bat in his hands. Tony was leaning against the hood of the Mustang, prepping a cigarette. Seriously, I just stopped by here for a piss and a burger, and you take out my car? Jeez, you all got issues. They all just looked at each other. Tony lit his cigarette and took a deep drag. <sighs> the funny thing is... Hey, what's your name? Mike, I said. Okay, Mike. The funny thing is, Mike, that we don't have issues. We're all set. Rolling in clover, you might say. He took another drag. Cat sat down on the sawgrass a few feet away. I might not say... Seems like cornering this stranger and smashing his car might look like issues to some people. Guess I grew up funny. 
Tom and his bat moved a little closer. For someone without issues, Mike, you sure got a mouth on you, he said. None of them said anything for a minute. I just wanted to get out of there, so I asked them point blank. So, can I leave now? Or do you mutant triplets have any other parts of my car you need to smash first? Tony flicked off the butt and came over to lend me his hand. I wasn't too thrilled to take it, but it seemed a modest gesture of goodwill at the moment. I grabbed his hand with my bleeding right palm, and he got me to my feet. Cat got up too. Not yet. You still have to talk to the boss. He makes the final call, said Tony. I was starting to shake now, part in fear and part in anger. The whole of me was working out how to deal with the rising fight-or-flight response building in my bones and in my blood. The adrenaline was making it hard to think straight. Boss? What freaking boss? Are you kidding me? Let me get in my car and drive away from you! Now! I pushed Tony out of the way. I was about to go to the driver's side door, but Tom was still leaning against it. I decided that I could get into the car through the passenger side. Glass shards were all over the leather seats, but I didn't care. I slid over to the driver's side and reached for the ignition. The keys weren't there. Tom shook them at me at just about his eye level. He seemed to be enjoying this little game. He then tossed my keys into the air, took a swing, and sent them sailing 40 feet into the sawgrass. Ah, come on! I shouted. I was in no way entertained, but the three of them seemed to find this exchange endlessly amusing, (laughs) indicated by their tinny laughter. I heard a car pull up, and I looked for the rearview mirror. I groaned when I was quickly reminded of its recent demise. I turned around to see who had arrived. It was Mitch, the gas station twin. Hey, boss man, can you tell these... these buddies of yours to let me go? I just came here for a... He held his hand up to shut me down. He didn't even look at me, but went straight over to Tony. You got this under control now, or is this going to be like the last time? If you want to screw up your clients, go ahead. But this one's mine. Whoa, 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 what are you talking... Mitch waved me off again, never taking his eyes off Tony. Cat and Tom were leaning into each other, and it made me a little sick. It's all good. He'll go with you, said Tony. He opened the passenger door and beckoned me with his hand. Come on, sport. Time to meet the boss. Like hell I will. Tom tapped the car door with the bat. Sure about that? He was grinning with those tiny teeth. That smile each of them wielded like a Cheshire cat, but with no hope they might fade away. I sat for a minute. What was I going to do? My phone didn't work, my keys were 40 feet off in the sawgrass, and these four savage mutant clones had me cornered. I decided to move forward with them until I could take a sharp turn somewhere. So where are we going? Tony drove Mitch's car, and I sat between the two of them on the huge bench-style front seat of the 1960-something Impala. We didn't travel long, and they had lost all gift for Gab. I wasn't doing any talking either, since I felt more like a product or a prize at that moment. Again, the car had no mirrors. These seemed to have been removed with care, not with the Louisville slugger method. We pulled into a gravel drive. Mitch ushered me ahead of him into what passed for a motel here. The sign faded and splintering from dry rot. The edges of the sign were ragged, and it reminded me of the too familiar teeth of my escorts. Was everything around here designed to look like the mouth of a leopard? I guess I shouldn't have been surprised when we were met at the door by another duplicate. It seemed they couldn't quite figure each other out, since they always took the care to emblazon their names on their shirt. This one was Marcus. They might as well have been Huey, Dewey, and Louie for all I cared for the game now. Boss is upstairs, he said to Mitch. He completely ignored Tony. Like they all had, he grinned at me like I was a steak. Nice catch, he said with a nod. Hey there, Marcus. You think you might want to call the police or something? Seems like your kooky little town has got itself all caught up in a kidnapping here, I said. He's a funny one, isn't he? Said Marcus. That might be worth something, Chuckles. Mitch took my elbow. Come on, up here. And we climbed up. To what I could only imagine but I was sure it had stringy hair and two small teeth, a chip on the front one. At the end of the hall, the late afternoon sun was lighting up the yellowed wallpaper, which was peeling away to reveal walls colored with a cancer of water damage. The floors creaked like they might just cave in any minute. 
and I was heading for that gaping doorway to see the boss. And there he was, just like the others, but more so. He was like the template for their copies. I got that same grin as he stood to shake my hand. Was he Borg Queen of this strange little nest? The demon lord of these minions? He said something, but I was too busy trying to keep my heart out of my throat. Flight was what my stomach begged of me. The adrenaline was making my skin itch and heat up. Sorry, what? I asked. I have a bargain for you. Mike, is it? I think you just might want to take me up on it. And if I don't? I didn't feel like bargaining with anyone right now, especially this guy. Still, I knew I wasn't in the best position to be fighting anyone on this. He laughed a little (laughs) and gestured for me to sit on a couch. Mitch leaned against the window and kept looking outside. Tony remained by the door. I'm Robert, he said, and sat in a wooden chair directly in front of me. As you may have guessed, I run this little... establishment. Yeah, about that. And you've made your way here, and now we might just have some use for you. He paused, placidly grinning at me. Forget it, I crossed my arms. Mike, he said, moving in closer. Let me tell you how it works here, and then you can make an informed decision. I glanced around for an escape route, but no. The only new detail I noticed was something large and flat, draped with a heavy black cloth, leaning against the wall behind Robert. He smiled knowingly and continued. You have something we need. More specifically... Something Mitch needs. And if you give it to him, you can stay here for a while and earn it back. I looked over at Mitch, but he wouldn't engage my eyes. And if I don't? Well, I think we both know what will happen then. Look, you've got my card. Just keep it. I just need to make a phone call, and I'll leave. No problem. Just give me a phone that works. You're not really seeing this just yet. It's a classic, worth almost 27 grand. I won't say a word. I'm sorry, Mike, but that's not the deal we have in mind. We don't want your car. He said car long and drawn out, like I was a child who had made some foolish error. We want your essence. Excuse me? Your essence. You see, we run a little trade-up program here. I get 25%, and Mitch here, since he found you, keeps 50%. You hang on to 25% just to function. What he was saying made my head spin. Was he some breed of soul sucker hidden in the foothills of the Berkshire Mountains? Waves of nausea swept over me. You're nuts! You don't get one freaking drop of me! I started to get up, and Tony reached for something behind his belt... I sat down again. There, that's better. We need you alive, Mike. Your dead essence is a less flexible commodity. He knitted his fingers together across his chest, leaning back into the chair. Plus, you do get something in return. The three of them exchanged hungry glances. I'll bite. What do I get in exchange for my essence? I held my breath. I give you a generous helping of mine, said Robert. You get most of the perks of being me. Pardon me for asking, but why the hell would I want to be you? Robert's smile didn't even dim. Consider the alternative. His tone changed, and it sent a shiver down my back. We could butcher you right here, take what little essence we can salvage, and Mitch here will be that much closer to paying me back and leaving. The wise money, Mike, is to hand it over freely. I sat as still as I could and imagined that I could camouflage myself into the couch. I could hear all three of them breathing in unison. This wasn't going to go away. I had to keep moving forward with them. Okay, I said, just loud enough for Robert to hear me. Robert visibly relaxed and slapped his knees. Good, now we're getting somewhere. He motioned for Mitch to grab the draped item. Together, they leaned it against Robert's chair, and then he sat down next to me. Tony shifted like he was trying not to see. 
Mitch here gets first dibs, since he found you first. Isn't that so, Mitch? Mitch nodded and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Mitch removed the black drape to reveal a large mirror, not broken, not painted black. It was the first real reflection I'd seen since this whole nightmare had begun. In the mirror, I saw my own skin. Next to my reflection, where Mitch's reflection should have been, was the flickering image of a much older man, undulating and mixing with the distorted image of Robert. What truly frightened me, what consummated the feelings of nausea into full-blown vomiting, was what I saw in Robert's place. He was there, of course, twisted and convoluted, with myriad souls dancing in and out of view. The torment in their captured faces was clear. One would surface and be subsumed. Another would rise, and Robert's countenance would again dominate. As for me, I was retching and shaking. I needed to get out of there. Put your hands on the mirror, Mitch said as he grabbed the sides of my head with his hands. His face was so close to mine, I thought he planned on an unholy kiss. I tried to lean back, but I could feel the energy leaving. It was streaming out through my ears like a river. In the mirror, I could see my reflection jerk and twist. It was fragmented, hollowed, and translucent. I must have screamed, but the sound was so loud in my ears I would not have heard myself. And then he stopped. The sound stopped. The pain. It all stopped. Mitch stood in front of me now, panting, hands on his thighs. Robert pushed him aside and positioned himself just as Mitch had. Now, this won't hurt the same, he said. It will just feel empty for a moment. And that grin. How I hated that grin. He checked that my hands were flat against the mirror, and I watched the reflection as the download started. I could feel bits of me sloughing off. It was much slower than with Mitch, but no less horrifying. And then I heard the unmistakable sound of my Mustang pulling into the gravel drive. Tony went over to the window to see who had arrived. Robert looked up, distracted. I swung my arms and elbows out hard and broke free of Robert. Mitch was still doubled over, and a quick kick sent him to the floor. Tony had left the door open and unguarded. I bolted and flew down the hall, the stairs, slammed into Marcus, and out into the early evening light. It may have been Cat or Tom or even some other mutant I hadn't met yet, but whoever it was was just coming onto the porch, and I knocked him down when he tried to stop me. I jumped into the Mustang, the recovered keys still dangling from the ignition. Several of them were running for me as I left them in a cloud of dry summer dust. I drove fast, cutting dangerous corners in the convoluted hills toward the northern border. I had no mirror to check for them following me. I did manage a few quick glances back on the handful of straightaways. I was alone. They didn't come for the rest of me. That was months ago. I haven't been back to Connecticut since then and my mother has grown tired of my excuses. She's going to have to get used to seeing less of me is all. And that's just it, I'm afraid. I've taken down the mirrors at home. I considered growing a beard for a while, but now I have it done at the barber shop. As long as I don't have to see, that's all I ask. I keep my blinds closed. And still, I can't shut down every reflection. A sunny day walking by the big windows in the city the accidental glimpse in a drugstore. They're everywhere. And each time, every last one of them shows the same thing. I'm not alone in there. I can see a hint of the too wide grin and stringy hair. I can see the slight build contrasting what I know is my true huskier size. I absently probe my front tooth for a possible chip. And every day I check to see if I've scribbled my name onto my pocket. Mike. Mike. Am I still Mike? Oh God, I only hope so. Author's Note When writing this story, I wanted my protagonist to deal with losing something very valuable. So I asked myself, what's the most valuable thing we all have? our soul, our self. So how do we lose something? We either put it somewhere and forget, give it freely, or have it stolen. So then what would motivate someone to steal another soul? And that's when I devised the story's pyramid scheme. 
With that in place, I built the story with Mike coming in as an unaware soul who was seen by the townspeople as a potential source. Once the predator-prey dynamics were established, the characters drove the rest of the story, and I just had to write it down. There were only two voices in this story, and I have picked out which of the two Dune Steefers, uh, Dune Stephanots, Dune Stephanians, which of the two Dune Steefers might do which. I'm curious to find out what they thought so too. The title was a last minute problem and I started googling poems about the soul and grabbed a line from one that I really liked. Poem of my soul by Asif Kabani. Although not perfect, I'm proud of the story and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Okay, thanks for listening. Good night. Wait. Welcome back, you mean to say. Come on, man. You mock me for saying the same thing every week, but I gotta do it because I leave it in your hands and you say goodnight instead of welcome back. Well, you stopped. I didn't know you were waiting for me to talk. <laughs> so, what did you think of that story, Rish? That story was effed up, man. Oh, hey, I know, Big Eggovich. He hasn't been back in a while. I love that guy. <laughs> you know, I really, really liked this one. I know I gave this one high marks. Boy, I'm showing my age, or my grandfather's age, by saying, I gave it high marks in composition. This story was creepy. I gotta admit that I I don't understand the story 100%, but I was creeped out by it. It had a whole lot of atmosphere to it. Things that were going on, you know, the guy goes to the bathroom, and the mirror is blacked out, and it says... Not for you. Yeah, it says not for you. That's <laughs> Just one all of those this, and they smash out the mirrors on his car, and the people are all well. Yeah, I think off, and I think you can see the truth in mirrors. Yeah, and by the end of the story, the, the main character can't look in a mirror either because the truth is there. Yeah, it was it was good stuff. I think it's a universal fear. Culturally, everybody shares a fear of losing their identity, of losing their individuality. And last time we did Chemo, the town of golden showers. <laughs> it's called the town of golden woods. So the, last week we did Chemo, the town of morning wood. Last time we did that Chemo story, which was similar in that it played upon that fear of no longer being you. The Chemo story was more of a Borg hive mind mentality of, of being assimilated into a, a faceless entity. It's not faceless. It's just, I don't know. I, I've talked about the Borg before on this show. Uh-huh. And just the thought that they could take somebody who is an individual, who is a feeling, creative, separate specific, person. separate person, and suddenly they are one of them. You're familiar with Next Gen? You used to watch yeah, that, right? Yeah. They take Captain Picard, who we love, and who who loves tea, Earl Grey hot, and Shakespeare, and archaeology, and young boys. And, and he loves being captain of a starship, and exploration. And they take that all away, and suddenly he is nothing. He is just one of those. He is another drone. And his individual distinctiveness has been absorbed. And he sheds one tear, and that's the only way that he has of fighting what has done to him. Whereas this, this this one is sort of a body snatcher kind of story. It's almost like a rape when it comes down to it. This person takes people and just violates them. And maybe it's more like a abusive husband that forces his will onto other people. And so there's these people who are separate and he is removing their separateness from them and replacing that with him. So no longer are they themselves. They are steadily becoming more like this hive king or whatever the heck he is. It's a kind of vampirism. Yeah. Or Romero zombieism of maybe infecting somebody else with your persona. Yeah. But what was so unusual about this, unlike anything I'd ever heard, is it's a sort of Amway pyramid scheme (laughs) kind of thing with this dude. And if you recruit enough new people, (laughs) then you will eventually reclaim your identity and be able to go your separate way. Right? Yeah, I guess. To me, that's totally fascinating and weird. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not good at math, but they kept talking about you get 50% or something, and then he gets 25%, and the other person keeps 25%. Would you get out of there with just two people and then you have 100%? It seemed to me more like 
you would always be chipping away. Like you get 50% and then you fill in 50% of the 50% that you're missing. One of those kind of things like you're always a smidge short every time you get another person. Maybe you do get free some way down the end. Maybe may, I, I haven't read the guy's spiel. I didn't get to read his literature that he hands out at his meetings, but I got the impression like these people were getting closer to themselves, but they would probably never really quite make it there. Yeah, I don't know that they regain their own identity or if they ultimately have to become someone else, but they are free to go. Hmm. Huh. All I know is I really, really like the story. And also, okay, I said I didn't get it. I don't get the title. I think it would make an excellent sting song where once your soul <laughs> dwelled. But there's I don't know. That. Maybe she's saying that your body is where once your soul dwelled, but now not all of it dwells there. You only got half. 25%. Big, you're crazy. I don't know. Not for you. So congratulations on that, Liz, and thanks for submitting your story. See, Liz is a friend of the show. Yeah, if anything, it just made me realize how talented she is, much more than I already knew. Now, she's got a podcast out there called Apparition. I, have we ever pimped that? Have we ever I think we that? have, but we can again. She wrote a novella, and uh, she recorded herself reading this story. I've listened to it through myself, and I really enjoyed it. I, I was really impressed by the imagery and uh, emotion that she was able to uh, conjure up. So we'll put a link to that on the show notes. That's right. And also a link to her blog called The Big Purple Couch. Cool. So I guess that brings us to the last of the Broken Mirror stories. That's right. And the final story. This one, if we were going to say that there was a winner of this, we, we have shied away from the word contest and called it an event, but... This story coming up is the story that received the highest marks. This could be considered the champion yeah. of the uh, Broken Mirror Story event. And it's called 27 Jennifers by Josh Roseman. Josh Roseman is a web guy who lives in Marietta, Georgia with his wife, daughter, and cats. This is his first published piece of fiction though he's been a television, radio, and web news writer for 10 years. His work appears most often on 11alive.com, where he works. He also writes for medzilla.com, where he recently completed a guide to getting hired in the healthcare and pharmaceutical industries. This time of year, he's obsessed with fantasy football and the Miami Dolphins. You can find him online at roseplusman.com or on Twitter at Listener42. This story is read, pretty much all the characters, by Danny Cutler. That's right, and the music is again by Roger Subarana. Twenty-seven Jennifers by Josh Roseman. Jennifer 2 For 20 years, I had no one to talk to except the computer, and the robots, and myself. The computer had no personality, the robots were mindless little drones, and I wasn't much of a conversationalist. Then she showed up. I must have been asleep when it happened. The sky never got lighter or darker here, just the same starlit twilight, so I'd taken to going to bed and waking up when I felt like it. I didn't feel like waking up only four hours after telling the computer to darken the windows and dim the lights. I needed a good nine hours of sleep to be functional these days, but I felt her and she jolted me out of a dream that melted away instantly. Computer. Interrogative. Who's there? The androgynous voice, which had resisted two decades of me trying to reprogram it into something a little more pleasant, said, There is another human present on the island. I practically jumped out of the bed and pulled on yesterday's clothes. They were still in a heap on the floor. The computer lit the way for me as I pelted through the house, snatched up my handheld, and left the small, domed building behind. I turned to the port, the only entrance to the island, 
so it only made sense that, whoever the human was, she had to be there. Computer, I said as I slowed to a lope. I wasn't as young as I'd been when Michael dumped me here, and try as I might to stay in shape, two blocks at a flat-out run was about my limit. Interrogative, who's the human? The human is a female, 24 standard years of age. It said through my handheld. She is in excellent physical health. No other information is available. Wonderful. No input. I heard a lot of that. I hadn't at first, but I'd stopped caring about the proper way to talk to computers. I'd been a doctor once, but now I was just a lonely, middle-aged woman living in what amounted to solitary confinement on an abandoned, man-made island city. I rounded the last corner and nearly ran the woman down. As it was, I had to jump to the side, catching myself a good scrape along my left hand as I dragged it on the plasquey wall in an attempt to slow down. Where exactly am I? Her voice was suspicious. Familiar, too. And who the hell are you? I took a good look at her. She was my height, slender, with dark hair and what they used to call a page boy. But it was the eyes that caught me. Who are you? She said again. I tried to shake some of the pain out of my hand. My name, I said, is Jennifer. Now she looked critically. I watched as she measured me, bright blue eyes flicking up and down. My name's Jennifer Davalos, she said, even more suspicious now. Where the hell am I? Even under normal circumstances, I didn't care for the deserted streets. Come with me. We can talk at my house. She didn't follow. And when I didn't hear her shoes on the Plascrete pavement, I turned back. What is it? Your scar. She'd gone pale. The one on your left arm. It had happened so long ago I'd nearly forgotten it. Fifteen years old, low gravity fencing, a high arc jump, but my opponent was too fast and her sword had whipped along the back of my left arm. If I'd worn a jacket or even a longer shirt, Jennifer would have never seen it. The new Jennifer, that is. The other Jennifer. The other Jennifer who was showing me the back of her left arm. The other Jennifer who had an identical scar. The other Jennifer who was me. Jenny 4 Jennifer, a Jennifer 2, we decided after a couple of days, had been the first to join me, but she wasn't the last. There were ten of us now. Five Jennifers, one Jen, and four Jennies, the most recent of whom showed up just yesterday. Jennifer 2 and I had had the place to ourselves for two years before Jennifer 3. The first two Jennies arrived only six months after Jennifer 3, and within days of each other. By now, we'd figured out what was happening. The story was the same for Jenny 4 as it had been for Jenny 1 three weeks previously. Her husband had gotten upset about something and stormed off to his lab. Jenny, or Jen, or Jennifer, whoever it was, went to sleep alone and angry in her bed on the science station that hung in orbit, but woke up on the Plascrete ground at the port. Days on Onkanon 6 were 30 standard hours long. Once there were five of us, we started sleeping in shifts, trying to catch the next arrival and figure out exactly how we'd gotten here, but it was as if our brains had just stopped. Well, everyone's except mine. I was always well and truly asleep when one of them arrived. And Jenny Four arrived furious, snarling, pacing my living room, glaring at the four of us, myself, Jennifer Two, Jen One, and Jenny One. As the first of each name, we decided it made sense for one of us each to be here, and Jennifer Two I insisted upon including because she'd been my first companion. That ungrateful bastard! I know, said Jen One. We all know. How did... What did he do? How come... I mean... She stared at us, getting a good look for the first time, and had to sit down. But she was back on her feet again in an instant. You, and you, and you, you're... She took a deep breath. You're me. Not exactly, I said. Yes, we're all Jennifer Davalos, and if you ask the computer in the medical center to scan us, our DNA will be the same. But we're not the same person. Not anymore. And why are you so much older? She asked, just as suspicious as Jennifer too had been. I shrugged. I think we're clones. That is, you're clones of me. I was the first Jennifer Davalos. From what we can tell, you're the tenth. She sniffed. I go by Jenny, she said. 
Michael hated it, but he had this look in his eye that made me want to fight him on it. You're one of mine, then, said Jenny one. She'd let her hair grow out, my hair, our hair, I supposed, tended to get wavy if I let it go without a cut for too long. What do you mean, one of yours? Jenny one got to her feet. I'm Jenny, the first Jenny, that is. Jenny four gave her the same once-over every new arrival had given those of us already here, all the way back to Jennifer two. What if I want to be in her group, she asked, pointing to Jen one. It's not like that, I said. We just thought it would be easier. The hell with that. I'm not going to be part of this. The four of us let her storm out. Jenny one gave me an apologetic look. Was I really that bad? You got over it. Jen two. Jennifer two was shaking my shoulder. Wake up, one, she was saying softly. It had been our little joke for our three years alone together. I was one, she was two. Now that there were twenty-one of us, the humor was gone, but old habits die hard. Come on, one, you have to get up. I blinked sleep out of my eyes. What is it? It's Jen two. She's here. Now I was awake. For the past six years, there'd only been one Jen. We were up to twelve Jennifers and seven Jennies, but only one Jen. And Jen one had been wondering when there would be another of her. I got dressed and followed two. Still slender as the day she'd arrived, still with the same page boy cut dark hair, still sticking with me even though I was twenty years older than her and looked it, out to the street. We met up with Jenny one and rounded the corner to the port, moving quickly. My hand went to my mouth as I distinctly heard myself gasp. Ah! Jen one had been on greeter duty for the week, even though no one knew had arrived for four standard months. Now Jen one had a black eye, nearly swollen shut, and was bleeding from her mouth. Jen two had her in a chokehold, and when she saw the three of us, she tightened her arm. What the hell is this? She screamed. Where am I? I was frozen, powerless. I hadn't seen violence like this since. Oh, of course, since Jen won. But Jenny won had knocked her on her ass with one good roundhouse kick. Most of the Jennies were athletic, and Jenny won in particular. She ran the exercise classes we all forced ourselves to attend. When Jen won had come into the medical center, restrained at first, we made her see reason. But that had been years ago. Jen won had calmed down, channeled her anger, and was the source of most of the new artwork in the house I shared with two. I hoped that Jen too would someday find a healthy outlet. First, though, we had to keep her from hurting Jen one any more. Jen, two said, stepping forward. Please let her go. No. As two got closer, Jen two backed up until her shoulders were against the port itself. I could see Jen one's face getting redder, but she trusted us. She trusted us to save her. Jen, please, two repeated. You're hurting her. Who is she? Jen Two's eyes darted around, and when she saw the rest of the Jennies moving to flank her position, she yanked Jen One's arm up and behind her back. Jen One couldn't stop the cry of pain. <gasps> Put her down, Jen Two said. Put her down, and we'll talk. We'll explain everything. I promise. But stop hurting her. Explain now. Jen Two twisted, and Jen One howled. And that was that. The Jennies moved in, and although I saw Jen One's face go white as Jen Two dislocated her shoulder, that was the worst of it. Jenny Six pressed an injector into Jen Two's neck, and she went limp. Jenny Four and Jenny Seven carried the mercifully unconscious body of Jed One to the medical center, and Jennifer Nine set her shoulder and fixed her eye. Jennifer Four restrained Jen Two, but Jenny Two and Four remained on either side of the newcomer's bed. I nodded. As the first and oldest, I was the unspoken leader, though we didn't need much leading when it came right down to it. And Jennifer Four brought Jen Two around. When Jen Two saw all of us glaring down at her, she stopped struggling. It was Jenny One who did the talking, and Jen Two, just like her predecessor, listened. Jennifer, 16. We learned from Jen, too. Seven more Jens showed up over the next year, along with four Jennifers and an eighth Jenny. 
Four Jennies were always called in when someone new arrived, and although two nearly got her leg broken when Gen 5 came to the island, for the most part, things were uneventful. What worried two and the other ones was the frequency they were arriving. Michael seemed to be more and more touchy. Jennifer, 16, was in tears as she sat on my couch, two's arm over her shoulders. It was horrible, she said, wiping her eyes with a piece of tissue. Ever since we arrived, Michael's been on edge. It's like his experiments are going all wrong, and he can't figure it out, and he t takes it. He... She broke down and two cradled her in her arms. Jenny inclined her head towards the kitchen doorway. Two nodded, and the other two ones and I left the living room, and I told the computer to close the kitchen door. I don't think Jennifer 16 noticed. It's getting worse, Jenny said. She was the decision maker among the four of us these days. Remember what Gen 8 told us? I nodded, more to myself than to the others. Michael had backhanded her in a fit of frustration. She'd hit him back, and that had been the end of her. That had been three weeks ago, and Jennifer 3 was still counseling her, trying to convince her that it wasn't her fault. So what do we do? asked Jen. We can't leave, Jenny said. We've tried. All of us, the Jennies, and I know both of you had your people try too. What about the port? I asked. Can we break through? To what? Jenny asked, almost snarling, though she shook her head and mummered an apology a second later. I could see this was bothering her more than any of us. There's nothing out there but argon air and acid seas. We're only here because Michael thinks he can remake this hellhole into something more people can live on. It's been almost ten years. There's thirty-three of us now. Jenny drummed her fingers on my kitchen island. I noticed she was painting her nails pale pink again and letting them grow long enough to click on the decorative blue and white tiles. We create. She obviously meant herself and the other gens. Maybe we can create something to get us back to Michael. But to where, exactly? I hated being the devil's advocate, but someone had to be, and Jenny had that gleam in her eye that said she was about to start organizing things. It's a huge planet. This was the only settlement. We can cross the sea, find another landmass, but what would be the point? We know Michael's still in orbit. His work was done from a geosynchronous satellite, and each time a new arrival showed up, she confirmed that he was still up there. Can you build a lift ship? I asked, and Jen shook her head. We can't just sit here and let him keep making more of us. Jenny's fingers were on the edge of the island, gripping tightly, the skin almost white at the tips. We have to do something. The kitchen door opened. <clears throat> Two stood behind Jennifer 16, whose eyes were swollen and red, nose still running a bit. I'm ready, she said, her voice hoarse and thick. I think. I was closest. I opened my arms and let Jennifer 16 hug me. I kissed her forehead and smiled. Welcome to the island. She smiled back ever so slightly. It was enough for now. Jenny 10 Another 12 showed up in what was, I realized one day, my 30th year of exile. They all came within days a week at the outside between each, until 45 of us populated the small island settlement. There was plenty of room, enough houses for each of us to have our own, even though the Jennies had commandeered one large home and lived together in it. There were nine of them now, plus 14 Jens and 22 Jennifers. I found it helped if I didn't think of them as me. None of the Jens could come up with anything on the island or create anything in the fabricator that we could use to build a lift ship. The Jennies wanted to find a way to take over the lift ship that brought the others to us, but we had no idea why everyone just shut down when it arrived. Then Jenny 10 came. I went to visit her in the medical center. Jennifer's 3 and 9 were standing near her, monitoring her brain. Jen 1 was sitting at her bedside, holding her hand, explaining where she was and what was going on. She told Jenny 10 she'd be right back and, while Jennifer 3 took over hand-holding duty, Jen and I went to the small office Jennifer 9 had been using since she'd taken over as head of the medical center. I took the guest chair. Jen hitched her hip up onto the desk. She's a blank, she told me. Nothing in there. Just her name. Jenny. Nothing at all? Jen shook her head. Doesn't know her last name, where she's from, even why she's got that scar. Did Michael... It doesn't look like he did anything physical, Jen said, but it was definitely intentional. How so? 
I didn't know a whole lot about cloning, and I had to think about what was the right question to ask. Is it the imprint? I mean, my mind? Did something go wrong? I don't think so. Jen looked at the wall screen. Computer declarative. Display brain scans of patient currently in main exam chamber. The screen lit up. Display brain scans of patients Jennifer 15, Jenny 9, and Jen 3. Comparative view. I watched as the scans appeared. Discontinue command interface. Abib told us that the computer was no longer listening. What am I looking at, Jen? Jen slid off the desk and pointed at Jenny 10's scan. I'm not a scientist anymore, not like Jennifer 9, but from what she told me, parts of the imprint were blocked through what she calls primitive methods. Primitive? Jen's finger traced dark spots on Jenny 10's scan, then indicated the same areas on the other three. Blocks, she said. Jennifer 9 believes something went wrong right after the imprint. If you look at the size of the blue area compared to the others, Jenny 10 hasn't had very much time to form new memories. Almost everything that was in there was from your original imprint. I cursed softly under my breath. Michael so insisted on the damned imprint. I wish I'd resisted. If you had, Jen said, smiling, would you and two be celebrating ten years together? Probably not. The thought of two never having existed hurt more than I thought. I'd loved Michael once, but now there was no room for anyone in my heart except two. And my... what were they anyway? Sisters? Daughters? Except for two, who was my lover, and Jen one, who had become my confidant and closest friend. They were just copies of me. Or, at least, I tried to think of them that way. It was easier than thinking about how many times Michael had replaced me. I sighed. Can Jennifer 9 do anything? Jennifer 3 is going to try hypnotherapy first, but if not, Jennifer 9 thinks there's enough in the computers to guide her through imprinting a newly grown clone. But Jenny 10's not newly grown. Jen shrugged. Jennifer 9 thinks she's only been out of the tank for a day, two at the most. She can clear Jenny 10's mind altogether with drugs and electrotherapy, then re-imprint her. I don't know, I said. That sounds like an awful lot of maybes. It is. Jen looked up again. Computer declarative. Clear wall screen. It went dark. Discontinue command interface. Then she waved toward the door. Jennifer 9 wants the four of us to talk about it, to put it to a vote. We can rehabilitate Jenny 10 as she is, but if this doesn't work... If it doesn't work, I said, following Jen into the corridor, then we've basically killed her. Jennifer 27 Jenny 10 had been the key, and it had taken two months, with four more Jennifers and two more Jens showing up in the meantime to prepare. Remember, Jennifer 9 said, leaning down over my bed in the medical center, you won't be able to move. If the sedative wears off, try not to panic. It shouldn't, but just in case. That's reassuring. My hands clenched into fists, and I forced them to open. I had to relax. If I was too keyed up, if there was too much alpha wave activity coming from my brain, then whoever was controlling the lift ship would know I was awake and might turn back. That was how Michael did it. Each clone was imprinted with the sensitivity to a certain range of sound that put her into a catatonic state until it was shut off. Only I was immune, so I had to be awake to start our countermeasures. Every one of the others had a program on her handheld that emitted a canceling sound, but I had to start it and when the disabling sound stopped, I would have to shut off the countermeasures. The sound coming from the handhelds would make the other's ears start to bleed, and shortly thereafter, their imprints would start to scramble. Without both sounds working in concert, the others wouldn't survive. Jenny Four had been our volunteer during that phase of the testing. Her body was in a stasis drawer in the morgue, the only one of us in 30 years to die. Michael would pay for that, for exiling us, and for killing... Well, when it came right down to it, for killing me. He'd nearly killed Jenny Ten as well, but he didn't have it in him to do that kind of violence. He just blanked her and shipped her down to the island after that first night. Jenny Ten had told us about it the moment she'd woken up from surgery. She hadn't been able to sleep that first night after Michael had had his way with her. And oh, how I remembered our first night in the station and how good the sex had been. Had gone to the medical bay for a sedative. Had seen a robot cleaning the cloning room. 
And then her natural inquisitiveness, my natural inquisitiveness, I supposed, had taken over. Michael had caught her, but not before she learned the truth. She was the 45th version of me that Michael had grown in the past 10 years. Jennifer? Except for two, they all called me Jennifer. Just Jennifer. A sign of respect, I supposed, acknowledging that I was the first. Are you ready? Ready or not, I said. Here I go. We were gambling, and I knew it. I could remain under for five days. One of the clones held the dead woman's switch, keyed to her brainwaves, and if she went catatonic, I would be brought back. But it was our best chance. Jennifer Nine smoothed my hair back from my forehead, and still smiling my most tender smile, pressed the injector to my neck. And I was awake. The clock one of the Jennifers had mounted to the ceiling told me that two days had passed. I remembered my instructions and took three slow breaths, then sat up. Jennifer 21 was sitting beside my bed, eyes open and unfocused. I reached down and cupped her cheek, but she was catatonic, just as we knew she would be. As they all undoubtedly were. All I had to do was tell my handheld to activate countermeasures and they'd all wake up. But one thing we couldn't know in advance was how much time we had between the catatonic state and the arrival of the next clone. Jenny One had suggested a four-hour window. One of my REM cycles was four and a half, which would give them, whoever they were, we still didn't know, enough time to drop off whoever had displeased Michael and get away before I woke up. I left the medical center and walked briskly along the streets. I passed the fabrication center that, after the automation had failed, Jennifer's five and twenty had been maintaining tirelessly to ensure we had food and raw materials. I passed the garden plot tended by the robots left behind when the island settlement had been evacuated 50 years ago. I passed the houses of my friends. I passed my friends, standing in the street, unmoving, captured like the finest statues, and fought the urge to wake them early. I felt lonely even as I passed Jen's, Jennifer's, and Jenny's, and I hadn't been lonely in ten years. Finally, the port came into view. I sat on the ground, just out of sight, and told the computer, via my handheld, to display the feed from the camera we'd set back up when it was just two and me. It took an hour before anything happened. I saw the lift ship slowly glide into position, its thrusters glowing white hot, the acid sea burning red below them. It backed up, closer and closer, but I waited. We'd planned this. The Jennies had planned this. The Jennies and the Jens and the Jennifers, every single one of them working together to escape. The ground vibrated slightly. The port began to cycle. Computer declarative, I said. Activate countermeasures. Everyone woke up in an instant. I couldn't hear either the countermeasure or the signal, but I knew it was working. I could hear them all converging on the port. I got on my feet and joined too as she passed, pulling her into a quick, fierce kiss before catching up with Gen 8 and Jennifer's 15 and 16. The port opened and an anti-gravity pallet floated out, piloted by a large, blocky robot. Someone was on it, asleep or unconscious, and as the Jennies advanced, it lowered her to the ground, far more gently than I'd expected. I also hadn't expected Michael's voice to boom out of the robot's mouth speaker. Step back! No chance, shouted Jenny One, who was at the vanguard. Let us onto the ship. Let us get off this island and move on with our lives, or we'll take the ship by force and do it anyway. No. Michael's voice sounded sad. Sad and something else. Something that made me pull, too, against the plastery wall of what had once been a sundry shop, back when this had been more than just a home for exiled versions of myself. I whispered to my handheld the command to open the door. Two followed me inside, looking confused. What the hell are you doing? Something's not right, I said. I can't put my finger on it, but something. I heard Jenny call out the order to charge the ship, and then the horrifying sound of blasters. Oh no, two whispered. I stepped around her and stared out the window. The robot was firing bright beams of light at the advancing women, at my sisters, my daughters, my friends, and they were being cut down where they stood. Some turned and ran. A few managed to get out of the way, but I couldn't keep count. I couldn't watch. I turned to two, and we collapsed to the floor together. I held two, and she held me, and we waited for it to end. And then there was her. 
too, was still as beautiful as ever. Maybe she wasn't as young as when my husband and I had come to Ankenon 6, but she was still slender, and her hair was as dark as her eyes were bright. I was 64. Ten years had passed since the massacre. All that remained, including me, were eight Jennifers, three Jens, and one Jenny. No one knew had arrived in all that time, and Jen too guessed it was because he had finally gotten one of us to be the perfect woman for him. I didn't care. Not anymore. My dear, darling Jen one was gone. Her screams had been clear to me above all the others. Maybe we were all the same on some level, but Jen one had been different, had been my best friend, and I missed her more than any of the other 41 who had died that day. Jen two was, well, she wasn't Jen one, and I still got a pain in my chest and a lump in my throat when I thought of her. I was in the garden with Chu. I'd banished the robots years ago when I felt the gentle vibration of the ground that told me the lift ship was back. We'd agreed, those of us who'd survived, that if it ever came back, we'd get the hell away from the port. I hope the others remembered. I met Tu's eyes and held out my hand. She took it and squeezed gently. It'll be okay, one. I won't let anything happen to you. Tu, my lovely, loving Tu, had become so much stronger. She was our leader now. I was just an old woman who lived in a colony of clones, exiled for some imagined slight. We knelt in the dirt and waited until the lift ship uncoupled. And then we heard the voice. Hello? It's not me, I said. It's not me, too. I know. She smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Let's go see who it is. Jenny Four was already there, talking to the newcomer. I pushed my way past the others, two by my side. Who are you? The woman was shorter than us, with flowing blonde hair and pale green eyes and curves almost voluptuous enough to be called exaggerated. She gave me a nervous smile. My name's Mary, she said. Mary Davalos. She looked from two to Jenny four, then at the others, clustered farther back. I don't mean to be rude, but where exactly am I? Author's note. You know, I have to say, when uh, Rish and Big first announced what the Broken Mirror short story event's subject was going to be, I was less than thrilled. You know, I thought that it'd be something maybe more specific, maybe less specific, I don't know. But I thought it'd be something where I would hear it and I'd be like, oh, awesome, this is exactly what I'm going to write about. Well, that didn't happen. And for about two weeks, I tried to figure out what I was going to write for the contest. And then I was driving home from work one day, and I had just bought this album by Mike Doty, who used to be the lead singer of Soul Coughing. And the song 27 Jennifers came on, and literally in an instant, I knew that this was my story. That there would be 27 people named Jennifer, also 16 named Jen and 10 named Jenny, and that there would be some sort of cloning involved. I didn't know much more than that, so I came home, I mulled it over, I played with my daughter, I put her to bed, and then I sat down in front of my computer, and two and a half hours later, I had the first draft of 27 Jennifers. And now you've heard the final draft. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed writing it. And I really do encourage you to go to YouTube and watch the 27 Jennifers video. It's kind of cool, and uh, I really do enjoy Mike Doty as an artist. I hope you do as well. All right, welcome back. Thanks for listening to that story. And Josh, thanks for sending it in. That's right. It was very well done. I really enjoyed the story. I thought it was uh, good stuff. Now, how many submissions did we have, more or less? 13 or so, something like that. They were like between 13 and 15, it's fair Uh to say. And this was the only one that was about cloning. Am I right? I think so, yeah. I, I, I guess we did a pitch session, you and I. The assignment was to write three possible premises for the Broken Mirror story event. Uh And we each presented them the way we would as like, you know, a top three list of things that we've crapped out. So we... Look, this one's long and skilly. I like that one. All right, OT. (laughs) All right, OT. Answer me, please. Oh, please. Can you ask him to edit that out? He wants you to edit something that I said out. No, it's fine. Cut it out. He says he's going to cut it out. 
All right. Well, at least he obeys you. So we kicked the six ideas back and forth and yours was the one that we ultimately picked. Mm -hmm. But my fear was at the time that they were all going to be about clones. Mm Mm-hmm. And no, none of them were except for the winner, which is funny, but it's not funny. Why am I laughing? Because it's late. That's true. We better hurry. We have no minutes left. It's 2.00 a.m. This the song, 27 Jennifers, the the Mike Doty song. Uh Now, were you familiar with that song already before you got this submission? I was not. But you knew who Doty was. I did. Yeah, I was actually a big fan of Soul Coughing back in the 90s when they were still together. I I was a big fan of their music. I absolutely loved it. I had all their stuff and I listened to it, but they broke up. And for some reason, I never considered that these guys, I mean, it's not like they all were in a plane crash and died. They continued on. And I never considered that Mike Doty might have solo music out there. So when this submission came in, it actually spurred me on to go out and find some of that stuff. And so I have listened to that song since then. And I've gotten to know Mike Doty's music well. And I really enjoy the stuff. It's like very acoustic now that he's uh, solo. Whereas back in the day, they were more electronic and produced and so forth. I really love this song, 27 Jennifers. And I think one of the reasons why I really like it is because I, like Mike Doty, went to school with 27 Jennifers. I swear there must have been at least 27 girls in my high school named Jennifer. I can think of five or six at least that I knew well. And you knew them well, (laughs) didn't you? Yeah. Goodness gracious, was that a popular name for girls that were born around the same time as me. They were just everywhere. The last segment you talked about an abusive husband for Liz's story. Right. The, the, the husband in this story, I mean, he's not really a character, but he is. It is all about him. I mean, he's the antagonist. He, he right. is the one at fault. He's the one that here. keeps rejecting these copies of this woman. It's easy to relate to this guy even though he's an asshole. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like the Jennifers are, are aliens or bad or I don't sympathize with them. I remember when I read the story being just afraid. Of how were we going to podcast this? How is it possible to have 30 characters uh, all voiced by the same reader? Or can you have the older Jennifer, the Jennifer one, be voiced by one actress and – than some of the others voiced by another. I, what was, was your feeling on that? It was a difficult thing to try and figure out. How do we tell them apart and so forth? And in the end, I just figured they're all the same person. So we'll just have the same person do all the voices. And You're a braver man than I, Big Anklevich. Hopefully it worked. Hopefully people liked the way it came out. Okay, so ultimately... You've got one reader for the whole cast. Right. Tell me a little bit about how this happened. (laughs) Because they're all the same person, and so we had the same reader do it. We figured we'd see if we could get somebody who's done podcasts before, who knows what they're doing. And so we asked uh, Danny Cutler to read this story for us. She's got a podcast called The Truth Seekers Podcast, which is a uh, political podcast of sorts. And there'd be a link to that on the show notes that you can go and check out uh, other stuff that she does. She's done several stories on Escape Pod and and some of the other worthwhile podcasts. uh, So how the hell is she here on the Dunstein? (laughs) I guess she's just nice. Well, there you go. That's that's all I need to hear. (laughs) So uh, I hope that they could tell the characters apart because what? There was 27 Jennifers, 16 Jens, 10 Jennies. That makes 53 different characters that are all the same person. Uh, Not like every one of them had lines or anything like that, but yeah, it's a lot to keep straight. Uh, Hopefully it wasn't a massive failure and everybody has gone through and removed the Doonesty from their subscription list on iTunes. We'll have to see, I guess. So there was that one part in this story which I thought was kind of interesting. I actually considered talking to uh, Josh and saying, are you sure you want to leave this part in here? But there was the part where he mentions that Jennifer 1 and Jennifer 2 are more than just friends. They are lovers. Mm -mm -mm. (laughs) Toasty. (laughs) I don't want to come across as some kind of a homophobic person or something like that because that's not the thing that made me feel strange about this it wasn't that it was two women that were lovers but these two women were the same person 
what does that make this relationship be? Is it an incestuous relationship or is it masturbation <laughs> or what exactly is going on here? Well, you'll always hear about Siamese or identical twins <laughs> oh, dating God. one another and nobody ever bats an eyelash uh, about that. Uh-huh. I, I don't suppose this is that far removed from a, yeah. the Olsen twins making out at a party, is it? Oh, yeah. wait. Oh, that just popped into my mind. You know what? That is wrong. Yeah. Huh. I just I, – I don't know. I, I think it's strange. I, I just don't like the Olsen twins. <laughs> yeah. The Olsen twins are pretty scary. But yeah, you do hear about – No, you don't. – twins who are willing to have threesomes with the same guy. I've heard of that. Oh, OK. Well, yeah. But maybe maybe that isn't real. Maybe that's just a man's fantasy. I, maybe that's not something that's ever actually happened. It was a, a lot of this story is a man's fantasy. <laughs> that's true. The search for perfection uh-huh. or the, the, the perfect woman is – I don't know. I'm sure it's unattainable, right? Because nobody is perfect and everybody is a human being and all uh-huh. that stuff. I mean even the physically perfect woman, there's going to be a flaw somewhere. Yeah. Right? Because – Because we're real. There's not – there's no such thing as a physically perfect woman. There may be someone who's close. Okay, so so we take the hottest chick who ever lived, Zelda Rubenstein, let's say, and she – wait, why are you looking at me that way? Okay, so whoever you imagine to be the hottest woman who ever lived and you get to know her and say you're going to find some kind of physical flaw and if you don't, then you're going to have to start nitpicking the personality and that seems to be what happened with this husband. Yeah. And – it's human nature that once you can just cast somebody aside, so it becomes easier to do it the next time. Yeah. And with this dude, any little thing is all it takes to set him off. And you got to wonder what it would be like to live with this man who has that much power yeah. over you uh, that you can just be replaced the drop of a hat or you don't even have to have a hat. He just He thinks about a hat. I guess you could say, I mean, this may be a sci-fi story, but it is sort of a horror story as well. If you put yourself in the position of these women, he doesn't he doesn't execute them, at least, but they live their lives in terror until they're shipped off. Banished. Interesting concept altogether. I really, really enjoyed it. So good on you, Josh. Josh is a male and he wrote a female centric story. Uh And Liz is a female and she wrote a male-centric story. (laughs) Yeah, that is interesting. I I don't know. That's just funny to me. I I, got to admit, I I was writing for 10 or 15 years before I ever wrote a female-centric story. Uh And probably I had been writing for 20 years before I ever wrote a first-person female-centric story. Uh And you'll be writing for 50 years before you get one right. (laughs) I respond to that. You know my writing. Uh, you would know. No, no, no I wouldn't because you don't let me see your stories. You write them and then you say, oh, this is my pretty little darling. I'm going to keep it here locked away in this room where no one can see it but me. You know, I think that this is a, this is a moment to address where is the Rish Outfield story in our Broken Mirrors event? Now, you and I considered reading our own stories. Uh-huh. And I, I think that was probably a given at some point because people would be curious. Well, well let's hear how, what your take. It was your idea. If my story had gotten a good enough... High enough marks. There you go. Oh, that's right. My day with my theme book. Back in art seven. If my story had gotten a high enough score, well, you would be hearing it right now. But fair is fair. And it didn't pass the mustard. I don't know if people... <laughs> do people still say that? They pass the mustard if you need it for your hot dog. Did I say mustard rather than mustard? <laughs> no, oh, no, it's past mustard, not yeah, the mustard. Well, see, this is why I'm not winning these contests, <laughs> folks, is I don't know the English language well enough to say. But, you know, the, the average scores ended up with 27 Jennifers at the top. And I thought it was a really good experience, this broken mirror thing. It's something that you and I do or did all the time. And I will be very happy to do it again, whether it's just us or whether it's on the air again in 2010, uh-huh. just the missions. I think it's awesome that that many people supported us or participated or were inspired by whatever you want to say. Lay the thanks at your own feet. Lay the thanks at our feet. Uh, lay the thanks at Mike Doty's feet. But <laughs> yeah, just so cool that we got those stories. Go onto the site. 
doingsteef.com. We've got a link to all the stories, I think, that were allowed to be posted on there. People have kindly said, go ahead and put our story on there so that people can read them and enjoy the way that we'd enjoy. That's right. Go and check them out. You want to see Rish Outfield's story? It didn't pass the mustard. It passed the ketchup, though. And, you know, in my mind, that's all that matters. Yeah, people really like ketchup more than mustard, so that's all that matters. Like I said in the last episode, the best part of this whole thing is being able to see all the different interpretations of this one little idea. We're not a hive mind. We're not Locutus Borg here. We are all different, and you can give us one little starting point, and we don't all run in a straight line. We run in every different direction so go and check those out and uh yeah i guess that's that for the 2009 edition of the broken mirror story event the premiere edition of it we'll see uh, hopefully it was good stuff big i went to target today yeah and in the halloween section they had a bride and groom skeleton oh, and when cool. you press the button they sang i got you babe <laughs> And I was just like, I have to own this. It was the <laughs> most brilliant thing ever. That reminded me. October is just right there around the corner. It's, you can see it. It's right there. We talked briefly about this off the air last week. Do we even want to do an October Scary Story event this year? Hell yeah. I thought it was great last year. Just altogether, I love the story writing event things that we do. I think pretty much every year, as long as the podcast exists, that we will have a Broken Mirror story event and a October Scary story event. And it should be every year, October and April. See, I thought you would be so burnt out because you worked way harder than I did on the Broken Wait, I take that back. I worked a hell of a lot more hard than you did, but that's because I wrote so many of the stories. But you worked a lot. On the Broken Mirror story event with the judging and sending them out to people and compiling results and sending rejection letters to me. How many did you send? A lot. Six, I I th- well, see, I was worried that you would be like, you know what? It's just too much work because you had complained that the work had become really oppressive or, or, or overwhelming. Hmm. And that's why we were asking for associate editors, co-producers. That's what it was. But yeah, to my surprise, you said exactly what you just Hell said. Hell Yeah. Please stop saying that. Okay. (laughs) Now, see, I've been doing the October Scary Story events for years. 2000, I believe. Wow. And there was 2007 that I failed to finish the story. And so I was going to do it again no matter what. Cool. And to find out that you wanted to do it was encouraging to me. It was cool. Yeah, I got to start thinking about what the frick I'm going to write it about. But Okay, well, explain because I'm sure one of the two listeners that we have wasn't around last year. That's probably true. Maybe both. The rules of the October Scary Story event are much simpler than the rules of the uh, Broken Mirror Story event. There's not a lot of... Is that ever going to get old? Yeah, I think it will get old. Anyways, it's not as constrictive. Basically, the idea is write a scary story. Write it in October. That's all there is to it. You have to write a story that's meant to scare people. From October 1st to October 31st, you have to write this. That's it. And then you just... Pop it into an email and, and send it on to submissions at doonsteef.com and we will take a look at it. There's not even necessarily a winner. Well, see, we do horror stories all the time. Right. So we did episodes that were specifically October. Warning. Singing. Last year, but uh, we'll just pick a few. I guess it depends on how many we have. Last year, we did four. Maybe we'll do four this year. Maybe we'll do less. Maybe we'll do more. I guess it all depends. Comes down to it, it's got to be a story that we would probably run anyways, I guess, is probably the deal. If we saw that story submitted at another time of the year, we'd look at it and say, yeah, that's a good story. What do you think? I like it. So we would do it. So that's how you're going to make it. Okay, so just put in the subject line of your email, October Scary Story Event or October Story or O-S-S-E, whatever you want. Yeah, just something to alert us to the fact that it's a October Scary Story Event submission. And, you know, just like last year, we'll do an episode where we talk about all the stories and blatantly lie about some of the submissions that we got, (laughs) make fun of each other. And, oh, such fun will be had by by you, really. No more vaginas! Oh, dude, that's mine for this year. I'm writing it. (laughs) (sighs) Well, thank you for listening all the way through. Probably have to take a week off because these episodes are so darn long. You have earned a week off. Just don't spend it in Canada. This has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Get from my sight, man. Gladness is a blight. And happiness 
stinks up the room. Good night. Have a wonderful week, folks. At the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Where once your soul dwelled, by Liz Mike Wazowski. Where once your soul dwelled. By Liz Mirjeski. Mir, is it just Mirjeski? Even though there's a ton. Mirjeski. Where once your soul dwelled, by Liz Mirjees. You're close. Mirjeski. By Liz Mirjeski. He did it! Hooray! Never again. Never again.